Okay, decomposition. Now, forensic entomologists get to deal with bodies that are old enough to attract insects, yet young enough to not be fully skeletonized. Therefore, we get intimately associated with the process of decomposition. This is one of my favorite lectures, just because there's so many gross pictures. I love giving this lecture to, um, to, oh, intro to forensic science students, to my biology students, to my human biology students, uh, my general ento students, all of those types of students who sort of need a little bit of waking up about uh, what happens in the real world. Now, um, I'm assuming as vets and scientists and entomologists in this class, you guys have uh, some association with these different uh, processes. However, I am required to give you a quick disclaimer. There are gross pictures coming up, FYI. If you are um, easily disturbed by these photos, I'm not sure you should be in this class. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just fast forward, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you say the decomposition. All right, let's do this. So we are going to talk about the process of death today and what happens to an animal after death. Now, first off, we have this definition of death. Um, the definition of general death is the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions and or the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain including the brain stem okay so notice that term irreversible that means that we cannot restart the heart and the breathing we cannot re-wake up that brain okay so once those circulatory and respiratory functions cease, it's not necessarily the end. Those initial stages of death are reversible to some extent, and it depends upon the capability of tissues to recover from anoxia, or lack of oxygen. So this, the uh, central nervous system, CNS, has the highest sensitivity to anoxia damage. In general, it takes approximately four to six minutes between the loss of oxygen and irreversible brain damage. With cutting edge techniques, it may between, be between 15 and 16 minutes, but that can vary based on age and temperature at which oxygen was lost. So, in general, if somebody goes unconscious, they are strangled, they are drowning, whatever, they'll usually go unconscious when, within about six minutes, and that's when um, brain damage will set in. The brain just doesn't have enough oxygen. Uh, cutting edge techniques will help. But the younger that a person or an animal is, and the colder it is when that animal goes unconscious or that person goes unconscious, the more likely it is that there won't be any brain damage. So there was a case, a human case, a while back, um, where a four-year-old boy went under the ice. I think it was in Minnesota. He... Uh, he was out with his family. He went through the ice at a lake. They couldn't find him for 40 minutes. So he was underwater for 40 minutes. They found him. He was, you know, just cold. He wasn't breathing. His heart had stopped. Everything. Um, they were, you know, got him in the ambulance. They were able to restart his heart. They got him to the hospital. He walked out the next day with no brain damage, no nothing. He was young enough and it was cold enough that everything slowed down and there was no brain damage. That's amazing. So 40 minutes he was able to stay under the ice with no oxygen, no brain damage. So the colder and younger the organism is, the animal is, the less likely it is that you'll have brain damage. The older and warmer it is, however, <laughs> so you drown in a bathtub, you're going to have problems. All right. Now, just a few terms I'll be using throughout this uh, lecture. Antemortem. Antemortem means before death. So this is while an animal was alive and mostly, shall we say, well. Okay, so antemortem before death. Perimortem means around the time of death, while postmortem means after death. So I'm going to talk a lot, a lot about that perimortem and postmortem activity. What went on right around the time of death and after death. Now, once an animal dies, the normal bodily functions cease and the body begins to break down. So circulation stops, chem the chemical composition of bodily fluids change, digestion ends, 
uh, the natural bacteria in the gut begins to take over and other animals begin to feed on the body. So we get those uh, decomposers, those transformers that we talked about in the last lecture that come along and try to free up that energy. All of this composition, this homeostasis that the body has spent its entire life trying to maintain just ceases and everything sort of goes out of whack. Now these things happen in a particular order and that particular order is called the post-mortem clock. So the second an animal dies, the post-mortem clock begins. Neat. So the very first thing that happens is the cooling of the body to ambient temperature. So all animals, or at least most animals, humans, everybody, keeps their bodily temperature higher than ambient. Unless you're cold-blooded, then you keep it higher than ambient, right? Okay. So <laughs> this phenomenon is called alger mortis. And it is possible for the body temperature to increase, in fact, if the environment is hotter than the internal temperature at death or the body is exposed to direct sunlight. So this alger mortis, you, you always want to take these, these items in the postmortem clock with a grain of salt, but it tends to cool down to the ambient temperature. And it cools down at a rate of about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit per hour. Now, this is a very accurate um, method of aging a dead body, an animal or a, um, a human. If it is found, shall we say, within the first 24 hours after death. Okay. Now, this um, body temperature is affected by numerous, numerous variables. So if the, once again, if the uh, ambient temperature is warmer than normal bodily temperature. If that body is wrapped in something, blankets or clothing or a lot of fur or something of that nature, if the body had a fever before death, all manner of stuff like that can kind of change this. But this general rule of thumb of one and a half degrees Fahrenheit per hour stands pretty true within the first 24 hours after death. So body temperature is taken rectally or in the liver with a special thermometer that is needed to register uh, extremely high and extremely low temperatures. So it is taken in these body cores because the skin or the surface of the body will lose, uh, lose heat very, very quickly, lose it very fast. So in order to do a liver temp, uh, you vets out there, I bet you know how to do this, but for the rest of you, for a liver temp, you just take a little small incision in the skin, thermometer is inserted into the liver or under a lobe of the liver in order to avoid damage to that liver, just like this uh, picture shows. And you use this core body temperature to estimate the temperature, to estimate the uh, time of death. And you do that by using this formula. This time since death in hours equals the normal body temperature in degrees Fahrenheit minus the rectal temperature or the liver temperature divided by one and a half. All right? So that's just the basic formula that you can use. And this is the formula that they're using. This is what they're doing when you watch all the CSI shows and the, a body comes up or something comes up and you see the uh, um, medical examiner come in and then the... They sit down by the body or they kneel by the body and then the, the camera sort of artfully pans away a little bit and then the medical examiner comes back with the, this body, this person died at two this morning. This is basically what they're doing. They're doing this alger mortis calculation. All right. Now, the normal body temperature of an animal, when we talk about this normal body temperature, uh, this is the average for a species. So you think about humans, our normal quote-unquote body temperature is 98.6. It's average across humans. However, humans have different bodily temperatures. Um, I personally run a little cooler. I'm normally at 97 degrees um, all the time. My husband runs a little hotter. He's normally at 99 all the time. So you think about animals, same exact thing. There are certain animals that will run much hotter in general and average, but then that average... An individual animal is going to be warmer or cooler than that overall average. So that's the type of problem you have with estimating um, time since death using alger mortis. Um, the average temperature may not give you a true uh, anti-mortem um, body temp for that animal. 
uh, the death may also not occur immediately after injury or, or the event that ultimately caused death. And the effects of that injury or that disease or whatever that caused the death on the body may cause the body temperature to fluctuate. So if the animal bled out, say, they're going to lose body temperature very, very quickly that way. If that animal was running a major fever, their body temperature is going to be much higher than normal. So this algor mortis is a little iffy. Okay. So heat loss can also be affected through transfer to objects in contact with the body. Uh, so if they're lying on a cold stone floor, if they're lying on ice, um, anything like that. Uh, movements of air over the body, if they're in a draft, in an air-conditioned home, that can cool down the body very quickly. Fat deposits, got an overweight animal, a lot of fat deposits on that animal will insulate that animal versus one that is starving, that is very, very skinny, much cooler body temp. There's a lot of body hair or fur naturally, or physical coverings on the body. So all of those things can affect how fast this happens. So this algor mortis beginning, this is just a rule of thumb, as a lot of these things are. In order to use this in order to um, estimate body temperature, it's recommended by forensic vets that the animal temperature should be taken at the scene and repeated over a three to six hour period to establish the rate of cooling. So once you find the body and then over uh, three to six hours, you know, once an hour or so. So the general rate of cooling is this one and a half uh, degrees Fahrenheit per hour at room temperature. And you just plug and play in this equation. Now there is a possibility of an initial temperature plateau during the early postmortem period that doesn't take into account changing environmental conditions. This is likely if environmental temperatures are high, uh, if the body or surface um, of the body has some sort of insulation, there's excess body fat, if they've lost a lot of fur, something like that. In these situations, it is recommended to add one to two hours to the postmortem interval uh, estimations in cases in which the plateau was likely. So what you want to do is if you see any of these situations, add an hour or two to your postmortem interval estimation. All right, that's it for this video. You let me know if you have any questions.